In this video, we'll be rebuilding the Berman CP gearbox from the Matchless G3L WD. If you watch the teardown video, you'll know that I'm doing this because of a strange noise from the transmission. Here it is again. my case the problem was the bearing for the main shaft of the gearbox and it was rotating in its housing here which you can see is all scratched up with witness marks um, but there could be a number of problems that would require you to tear the gearbox down and reassemble it so hopefully this video will be of some use to you even if your symptoms are different I bought new bearings for the main shaft for each end they were relatively cheap and they're a very tight fit when you put them in so I popped them in the freezer for a day or so uh, to make it slightly easier to get them into the housing. Now with the housing all cleaned up I'm adding some bearing strength Loctite. And now we put the new bearing in using that advanced engineering technique of twatting it with a socket and a hammer. You'll notice that this bearing is sealed which should make it maintenance free and longer lasting. And you can tell when it's all the way in against its housing because the tone of the hammering changes. The smaller bearing at the other end of the main shaft on the inner case pushes out with finger pressure. This smaller bearing takes much less load than the main shaft bearing on the other side of the gearbox, but I still take care to clean the housing, apply the glue and press it in carefully. You may find if you look at your gearbox that this bearing has some form of retaining uh, washer and spring clip on it. Mine didn't have one, which I was a bit surprised about, but it didn't seem any the worse for it. Next we insert the driving gear and this is another component that benefits from some time in the freezer because it's a really tight fit and we push it in from the right hand side. Hammering it in with a socket we again find that the tone changes when it's completely home but as a guide it should protrude by about 35 mil. Now we have to seal the driving gear to stop any of the lubricating grease seeping through and for this, first we put on the felt washer, then a plain steel washer, and then a circlip which fits into the groove around the inside of the housing. Now you can buy a modern replacement seal uh, instead of all of this which is so good that it will hold oil in the gearbox and you can lubricate it with that instead of grease which can be fiddly and indeed I bought one but I couldn't quite see how it all went together so in the end I bottled out and just put it back together as it was when I dismantled it. Now we fit the gearbox small sprocket. First of all there's a spacer, quite a thin one and then one that's a little bit wider that goes on top of that and then the sprocket itself with the proud protruding bit facing towards you. That goes onto its spline so it can't rotate on the shaft. And then the bit that was missing when I took it apart, this locking washer, the tabs of which will fold over to keep the nut in place. And finally, the nut. Now at this stage, we'll only do the nut up finger tight. That will allow us to get some chain tension on later and tighten other things up. But finger tight's good enough for the moment. And now we're ready to assemble the gearbox before we put it back. So we need some workshop essentials. The photographs that we took when we took it all apart so we know where all the gears go 
and a nice cold glass of cider. So after much head scratching, this is how I think the gears go. So here's the lay shaft, which I think is symmetrical. Doesn't seem to make any difference which way I do this. So first we've got this sort of double one here. Uh, again, that's symmetrical, I think, but I'm putting everything so that the numbers face me. That says 18. That goes on the middle there. And then next, we've got one that says 27. And that's got to go so that this one can fit inside it. Like that. And then the end one is a 20. And that goes over the spline like that. Next, we've got this big one here, which has got two numbers on it, 32 and 18. And we want the protrusion facing us and the recess so that, that sliding gear can go into it. Like that. So the sliding gear can be in that one or that one to alter the drive. And then uh, this one is a 23. And this just slots on the end, and that's the last gear on the lay shaft. Now the bottom fork goes into the sliding gear there. And the top one goes onto the sliding gears that go on the main shaft. Like that. And that is how the gears go together. The third gear which was the first thing we removed once we got the main shaft on that will go on here and that's so arranged that it can actually fit that gear inside it like that and that's how they go and now the whole gear ensemble can be gently coaxed into position with the um, main shaft lining up with the drive gear and the other two shafts going into their little bushes. Now when you put it in, because it isn't being held from the kickstart side, it will kind of all relax a little bit and look a bit higgledy-biggledy when it goes in, but that's fine. And now we push the main shaft in from the other side of the bike and gently work it through as far as it will go. And that holds things together a little bit more tautly now. But still, the lay shaft, the bottom one, will seem to be a little bit relaxed and low as it settles in the case. Now we put the washer on the end of the lay shaft and turn the cam until the little mark is in the nine o'clock position. Now place the third gear, which should be the only cog you have left, back on the main shaft. Next we fit the spring and the grub screw that put pressure against the camshaft pole. Now I obsessed for ages about why this wasn't locating into any of the grooves on the cam and it doesn't, it just kind of sits on the shaft between grooves. The important thing is that the mark on the end of the cam is at the nine o'clock position. This is an awkward component to screw in because there isn't much space. There's an oil pipe and there's the frame and you need a short handle screwdriver and the pressure of the spring is quite strong. Uh, but you need to screw it home as far as it will possibly go and not screwing it home apparently is a common cause of bikes jumping out of gear. And now I'm cleaning up the face of the gearbox shell with some brake cleaner and a brass brush to make it ready to accept the gasket. Here I'm applying a thin smear of multi-purpose grease to the face of the gearbox shell to help the gasket stick when I apply it. Like many of the parts I've got for the bike, I purchased a gasket from AMC Classic Spares. Now Steve Serby, who runs that, 
is absolutely brilliant. If you call him up and talk to him about the part, he'll give you advice. He's an enthusiast. He runs bikes like this himself. And everything I've ever ordered from him has arrived the next day really well wrapped, which is great when you don't want to be stuck waiting for parts. So AMC Classic Spares, look them up on the web. They are awesome. For me, the trickiest part of putting on the gasket is getting it over the bolts because the hole's only just big enough. So what you can do is use a paper punch uh, to just to make the hole very slightly bigger. And that won't affect the seal, but it'll make it less likely that you'll tear the gasket as you put it on. Now, I do apologise, but I lost the clip of putting the inner case on. But it's pretty straightforward. You just lift it up, offer it up to the gearbox shell and push it on. It goes on easy as pie and the main shaft comes through its small bearing. Now I'll replace the four bolts that hold the inner case on. You'll notice that I put a bit of string through this and labelled it. I do this with all parts and take photographs. I'm pretty obsessive about that because there's nothing worse than looking at a whole bag of bits and wondering where everything goes. This might be a good moment to pause and just look at the different components while we can. So clockwise from top we have the main shaft poking out through its smaller bearing and then in the one o'clock we've got the cam pinion which has got that middle mark which needs to be in the nine o'clock position and then in three o'clock you've got the bush for the gear selector where its little axle pops in and then at the bottom there we've got the end of the lay shaft and then in the nine o'clock position we've got the bush for the kickstarter that's where the kickstarter axle goes in now the pinion for the kickstarter, the little cog, goes on the end of the main shaft and that's what we'll put on next. First there's a washer that goes over the main shaft and that stops the spring which is going on next from interfering with the bearing. And then we've got the kickstarter pinion assembly which consists of a spring which goes over a cylinder and then you've got uh, a pinion and then a nut that goes on it and the pinion has got a serrated edge and that needs to face the nut because it interfaces with it. Now when you try and tighten this assembly up of course it wants to rotate so a good little dodge here is to go around the other side of the bike and attach the clutch basket. It doesn't need all of its uh, bolts and everything just just attach it so you can grab hold of it maybe jam a screwdriver in it if you like and that'll give you uh, just enough um, of, a, of stopping power to torque it up on the other side. Now my clutch cable adjuster was broken when I disassembled the bike uh, where it goes into the back of the gearbox case and you can't buy the clutch adjuster on its own because once the cable's through it at the end of it is soldered on. So I bought a complete new cable and I need to take the old one off in order to fit it. Now here I'm taking the new clutch cable complete with its adjuster on the end and comparing it with the old clutch cable. Now they weren't exactly the same length, but don't worry if this happens to you as well, it doesn't matter whether they're the same length or not really, so long as it's got enough length to get around the bike. What really matters is the difference between the outer sheath and the length of the inner cable, because that's what provides the tension. So here I am fitting the new clutch cable, just slotting it in to the handle at the top, and I use little rubber retainers uh, to hold it onto the bike. And when you route this, it goes through the middle of the bike, out of the other side, and into the gearbox in the back where it just screws in. Now I follow the same process to clean up the face of the gearbox as I did for the inner bit. So brass brush and some brake cleaner, and then a little bit of grease smeared around the edge just to help the gasket stick, and then carefully work the outer gasket into position. Also, I use a screwdriver to flatten it down against the base of the bolts so that it doesn't crinkle. And now, I didn't film this, but I placed the um, clutch shaft into the middle of the main shaft. It can go in from either end. And I've got two ball bearings to put in here. Most bikes should just have one, but I had two. I counted them all out and I counted them all back in again. And then finally, the little forked piece which engages with the clutch actuator on and it just sits and balances in there. Now this is the bit that can seem really complicated and it may seem like you need five hands, but once you know what to do, it's actually straightforward. So looking at this picture, just ignore the fact that I've put the spring box onto the gear selector shaft and look at the gear selector mechanism, which has got a ratchet and a little mark on it. And that mark should line up 
with a nine o'clock mark on the end of the cam. That's the first important thing to get right. Now this is the point where we should put the spring box onto the gear selector shaft. And as it goes on, there's a little spigot, and you can just see the end of it underneath my right thumb when I put my hand on just here. And that goes into a recess in the other piece that's already on the bike. And that holds everything nice and centered. And then put on the plate that covers the back of the spring box. Now leaving that in position on the bike, turn your attention to the Kickstarter case and put the Kickstarter ratchet with its spring into the case. Now at the end of the spring there's a little loop and that goes over a stud and it secures it. You should just be able to press it over with your thumb. Once you've done that we need to put some tension in the spring. So for that just put the Kickstarter on. No need to do up the nuts, it'll hold itself on with stiction. And we need to give it two full turns. But don't be too enthusiastic because this spring is a little fecker and as you start to turn it, it'll try and wrap itself around anything that's in the way. So just turn it a little bit and then use your thumb on your other hand to just free things off. It'll try and go over studs, it'll try and go uh, loop around itself, it'll stick on anything it can see in there. But with a little bit of patience and care, you'll be able to get it two full turns and then that's enough and now you have to try and hold this in one piece. But don't worry about where the kickstart lever is because we'll reposition that later. Now this is the bit that seems ever so slightly counterintuitive. Having carefully positioned that spring box and the mechanism behind it and the rocker pull on the bike, pull them off the shaft and put them into the kickstart case. There's a nice little um, spigot there which goes into the back of the spring box and that holds everything steady. Only when you've done this is it safe to then put the kickstart case back on the bike. You can also help to keep things steady by just fitting the gear selector pedal over the end of its shaft. And you can see I've got my right thumb over it here and that just helps keep everything absolutely steady as you work the case onto the bike. And as you push everything onto the bike, look down for that little hole at the top there where the grease goes in, and the clutch actuating rod should line up between the fork of the thing that you put in on the end of the, uh, of the clutch rod. They should just line up nicely together. If they don't, then just take it off and try again. Now do up the five bolts that secure the kickstart case. and slip the clutch cable into the slots at the top of its actuating lever. You'll want to position the kick start lever so it's in about the 11 o'clock position as you look at it from the side of the bike. You can always move it if it's not quite right. This is more or less the right position for the gear change pedal. It seems to slope down quite a lot, but if you imagine the end of the pedal should be more or less level with the foot peg and you can see the hole in the frame where that's going to be slot and the pedal will be slightly higher. So this is about right and tighten up the nut. Now if you've ever tried to put grease in a gearbox you know how difficult it is to get it to go in and settle towards the bottom and how thick it is. So here's a method I use which I've had some success with. Take the grease and mix it with the engine oil that you use to lubricate the bike anyway. Mix it up about one part to eight and put it in a heat proof container and get a heat gun underneath it. And as you mix it and heat it, it becomes uh, less and less viscous and easier to get into the gearbox. Now to actually get it into the gearbox, I made a makeshift syringe out of an old tube uh, vitamin tablets and then a little plunger, which that's just a nut and bolt with a couple of washers bolted onto it. And then just fill it with the warm grease and push it in. That seems to work quite well. I've had no leaks of this and it seems to transfer across the gearbox and lubricate everything really well. Small safety point worth noting though, 
Don't use a fondue set that you got for your wedding present 32 years ago. Don't empty all your wife's vitamin tablets into the bin to use the tube. And don't nick a stethoscope to listen to the gearbox. Because if you do, hell will visit you. Don't ask me how I know. The next stage is to put the drive chain on. And the reason we do this is so that it will hold the gearbox sprocket still while we tighten various things up. But do yourself a favour here and loosen the adjusters on both sides of the bike and then the nuts on either side of the main, of the main wheel, the rear wheel rather, and then move the rear wheel forward to give yourself a bit of space so you don't struggle when you put the chain on. I find the easiest way to reconnect the chain is to put it over the rear sprocket uh, so that two links from adjacent teeth and then put the, uh, the split link through the middle. When you put the little clip on it to hold it all together, make sure you, that the round blunt end, i.e. not the open end, is pointing in the same direction as the chain goes. Now put the two adjusters back to roughly where they were before and do up the wheel nuts. And because we're going to be fiddling with the tension of the primary chain, we're going to have to come back to this and alter the tautness later anyway. Now you'll be able to tighten the gearbox sprocket nut and fold over the tabs on the washer collar. Use the rear brake pedal to hold everything still while you tighten it. That's why we put the chain on. Position the chain case on the left hand side of the bike. You'll notice the clutch cable just above it. That's going to sit between the chain case and the main engine block. Do up the nut and bolt that secure the chain case to the battery tray. Then do up the three bolts at the front of the chain case. The dynamo sprocket has a little semicircular piece of metal which is a key and that goes on to the dynamo sprocket axle before the sprocket itself and it's important to locate this carefully because it helps to hold the sprocket in place. Refit the spacer for the front sprocket. Now refit the front sprocket the dynamo sprocket and the chain that goes between them as one component. And as you do this, make sure that the slot on the inside of the dynamo sprocket lines up with the key and doesn't displace it as it goes on. Now there's a small washer that goes on the dynamo sprocket axle and it goes quite a way in there. You might have to poke it in with a screwdriver. And this is followed by the nut, which at this stage will do up finger tight. Now you have to hold the dynamo sprocket at the back with a special tool. It only costs a few quid uh, because most spanners are too thick to get back there. The tool has a dual use and the two little forks on the end there are for holding the clutch spring nuts when you do them up. On top of the nut 
goes a washer with two little tabs, it's obvious where they go, and a little spring to hold everything in place. So the front sprocket now, and this weird looking thing is the cam shock absorber that goes on and it mates in with its partner. That's followed by the spring and then a cup shaped washer and then the front sprocket nut itself. Now the nut here is quite thin and the socket's prone to slipping off, but get as much tension on here as you can. Now to the clutch. First we put on uh, the large washer stroke spacer that just fits over the axle there of the um, clutch main shaft followed by another little spacer and now because the next thing we're going to do is put the roller bearings on just apply a little bit of grease and this will help them to stick now when you put the roller bearings on they're magnetic and they'll actually hold themselves onto the metal there and if they don't if they appear to push away then remember they've got a north south pole so just turn them around and put them on the other way and it'll be fine and uh, it looks physically impossible, but if you're careful as you do it, you'll easily be able to build up all 24 roller bearings in a nice, neat circle. Once you've done that, and with great care, put the clutch basket over the whole arrangement. When that's neatly in place, there's a washer that goes over that to stop the roller bearings falling out. Now put the primary chain back on and do up that little clip so that the blunt end is pointing forward in the direction of rotation of the chain. Now it's time to put the clutch inner basket on, remembering that there are four bolts that go in here. They've got a flat side that needs to go towards the inside so that the bolts don't rotate once they're dropped in. And then put it over the whole arrangement. It'll sit on its own little spline. And then, in my case, I had this sort of a brass washer and a nut to go over the top. I'm not completely convinced that my clutch assembly isn't a little bit later than the rest of the bike. So if yours looks different, then just reassemble it in the order in which you took it out. But this is how mine came. And you can see I'm leaning on the brake with my left forearm here to hold everything still while I talk it up. And finally we're putting the clutch plates in, uh, the pressure plates with the blank ones and the friction plates, the ones with the friction material. Now yours might look slightly different to mine, I attribute this to mine probably being a post-war clutch, um, but the principle is the same, it's pressure plate, then friction plate, then pressure plate, until they're all in and you should have a pressure plate at either end when you're finished. So now we'll fit the spring pressure plate before you place it over the clutch. There are four little cups that go into each of the holes and this provides a nice tight space for the springs themselves and the nuts to sit in. Uh, but don't forget, as I nearly did, and the clutch operating rod, that needs to be in there running through the middle. Then offer up the spring pressure plate to the clutch, making sure the clutch operating rod goes into the little dimple right in the middle there. And once you've done that, 
take one of the springs with the nuts on it and offer it up, up to the hole and then take the tool and you have to press it in and then rotate it until it bites and then screw it in just a little bit uh, before working on the others. And as with most arrangements, when you have lots of bolts, work to the opposite bolts and try and tighten them up gradually so that one doesn't get more stressed than another. Once you've done up the clutch spring adjusting nuts, which you should go all the way home as tight as they will go, then unscrew each one four complete turns. And that puts the spring in the optimum preload position. And all that remains now when the clutch is adjusted is to refit uh, the chain case, the foot rests and the exhaust. Uh, I won't bore you with that here, there is a separate video for that uh, if you need help with that. So that's it, the gearbox back together, um, it worked perfectly and uh, I'm off happily riding the bike again. I hope that's been of some use to you. Uh, if I missed anything or got anything wrong, please do get in touch, I will definitely correct it. And if you know a better way of doing it, I'd really like to know about it. And here now is a summary of all the steps.